movies are books. Oh, you know, um, maybe it was seeing the movie Hamlet when I was a little child, and uh, I saw Hamlet's ghost, uh, the father's ghost, talking to Hamlet. And I remember my mother pointing it out to me and said, that's the ghost. Thank you. And you wrote several books about vampire, which is Angel, and now Wolf's Why? I love fantasy and fantasy figures. It's my way of talking about reality. I can talk about what matters to me when I'm writing fantasy. Okay. Uh, how many books uh, do you plan for this series? I haven't made a plan. Um, I've written The Wolf Gift, the first book. The second book is already coming out in America, uh, The Wolves of Midwinter, and I'm sure there'll be a third book, but beyond that I really haven't planned. Okay. Do you have a favorite creature that you want to write about? A favorite creature? Yeah. I think I love all the old classic monsters of European legend, uh, the vampire, the, the mummy, um, the uh, the werewolf, and the witches, I, I, and ghosts. I'd like to write about ghosts. I have no real favorite. They're all wonderful. They're all exciting to me. Okay. Um, do you have a message for the French readers? A message uh, only that I love being here, and I absolutely love being in Paris, and I, I'm so I'm thrilled by the fact that, that people are reading my work in French. I'm so grateful for that. And last but not least, if you can pick up three songs that can resume, that can summarize uh, you and your books. Three songs. Um, that would be tough. I, I think the songs of Mary Fall, the American singer, the October Project, they did a beautiful song, Take Me As I Am. That really gets the feeling of interview with the vampire and the wolf gift, and uh, that music is very beautiful. Sometimes I think the wild song, Living, Living, on a Prayer by John Bon Jovi sums up the way I feel about life, crazy as it is. Uh, so I would, say, I would stick with those two. Uh, I'm not sure I can think of a third. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. To do the, the wolf gift, there really wasn't a lot of research required. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look up the European legends about werewolves very quickly and read what they are, and I already knew them. So the only real research I did was watch movies. I wanted to see what people had done over time in the movies mm -hmm. with the werewolf, and I wanted to be sure that what I was doing was completely new and hadn't been done before. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that. I, I especially like Neil Jordan's The Company of Wolves. Mm -hmm really wonderful film, and I like the first werewolf movies with Lon Chaney Jr., the black and white films, in which he walks upright like a man and actually wears a shirt and pants when he's turned into a wild wolf. But um, that was about the extent of the research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not very... Um... Well, I wanted to do something with it that I don't think had been done. I wanted to present the change from a man to a, a man wolf as pleasurable because I thought it would be, to suddenly feel your muscles expand and your body cover with hair, that that would be something very pleasurable. And I wanted to do it in that way. And I also wanted to speak about it as if it was prompted by hormones. I was interested in having a little science in there. It's, it's not really science. But, you know. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I am myself a law-abiding citizen and believe that every criminal deserves due process. But I think uh, many of us are very, very uh, stressed and worn down by the constant presence of violent crime in the news and in our lives, in America especially. And it's, it's a great pleasure to make a fantasy hero who can punish violent crime instantly and does not have to get a lawyer for the accused, you know. And, and I think that that's the appeal of fantasy, that we can express our frustration and our anger and our rage in fantasy in a safe way. We can't do that in real life. I can't tear apart killers and rapists, you know. I'll go to jail if I try. But I can pretend to be a man wolf who can, who can, whose instincts are infallible when it comes to evil and good. And I enjoyed that. I think it resonates with what we're all experiencing. Fantasy is, is like our dream life. It's always... Well, I, I, I think Ruben is really like a lot of people today. He's just not stereotypically young.
But there are many, many young people who speak in complete sentences and actually like beautiful furniture and actually do read poetry. And they go to college campuses all over America and they study English literature and they're very literate and they're very uh, polite. But I never write about stereotypical teenagers or stereotypical young people and I don't, you know, write about them in terms of slang and vernacular. Mm -hmm. I write about people like the people I know. My my son could be Ruben, you know, when he was 21. He was a highly intelligent uh, young man who spoke well and, and loved beautiful things and had good taste. And I think there are many, many uh, people like that. So I was quite surprised when people felt Ruben was not a typical young person. You know, I've never written about typical people anyway. I always write about exceptional people and outcasts and outsiders. Oh, I think absolutely that any werewolf story, like any vampire story, can be seen as a story about teenagers coming of age. Because teenagers go from the serenity of childhood and the certainty of childhood to this very confusing period of adolescence where they do feel like monsters as they develop psychologically and biologically and erotically. So I think this is one reason young people have always loved vampire stories and werewolf stories. I don't know why I chose to do it from the point of view of the vampire, except that it was what I wanted to do. I wanted to know what the vampire would have to say. I was tired of watching movies from the point of view of the victim. I really wanted to hear the monster speak. And I think a lot of other people in the culture at that time had similar ideas. It was around that time that The Godfather was written, which was the first crime novel in America to talk about criminals and let them tell their own story and speak with their own values. And, and little, around that time, too, the first big Superman movie was made with high production values where you saw the backstory of Superman, you know, his emotions and what it was like to grow up being Superman. So I think there was a general movement in the culture to, um, to get into the villain, to get into the comic book hero, to get into the bad guy and let that person speak for himself. It was just something that we wanted to hear at that time. It was a perhaps a new kind of romanticism. Well, I, if I understand you right, for me, it's the only way to talk about reality. It's the only framework in which I can talk about what matters to me. Cosmic questions of good and evil, uh, right and wrong, uh, the human heart. And I think many fantasy writers feel that way. If we're, when we're writing fantasy, we access our world. Mm -hmm. And we can't really do it through realism. Realism and realistic fiction uh, seem too artificial for us. I know that sounds crazy, but it's really that. Oh, I think Lestat would like the werewolves a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they would make friends. <laughs> but I don't think I'll ever mix the two in a, in a novel. Mm -hmm. You know, my different fantasy um, series, they have different textures. And I have tried to mix them in the past. I'm not so sure it was successful. I mean, I like elements of the novels that I use to mix them. But I, I think, again, they have separate textures. Mm -hmm. The Talamasca can appear in all the novels and do research on all of the supernatural creatures. But they are too different to share the same world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something new. Well, I did. I thought I was doing something original with the vampire myths that hadn't been done before. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I was just doing what gave me pleasure. I wanted to write the book I couldn't find anywhere mm -hmm. about a vampire, where he mm -hmm. talked and told you what was going on. Same way with the wolf gift. I want to write the book where the wolf is, the man wolf is conscious mm -hmm. and knows what's happening when he's changing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't lose his memory, doesn't black out, doesn't become totally absorbed in the beast. I wanted to know what his feelings were about all that hair coming out and getting taller and stronger and what it felt like to rescue people. So it, it was. But I also wanted to draw very much on the traditional images, the Gothic atmosphere, the romantic impulses, all of that I respected very much. I wanted a continuation of that in a new way. In fact, what the Your vampires are model for... I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want them to be. Why do you think... Uh... Well, I, I know the vampire's always been the, the most sexy of all the monsters to me because of two things. Number one, um, he can be an eloquent talker and a seductive uh, personality, 
and still be a monster. And also the intimacy of sucking blood. The intimacy is like a kiss. It's like making love. You embrace the victim and you hear the heartbeat and you take the essence of life out of the victim. And to me, that's really a metaphor for erotic contact. It's, um, it's built into the concept right there. Now, when I was a little girl, I went to the movies and saw this beautiful movie, Dracula's Daughter. And right there, there was this, this wonderful countess in a beautiful gown with gorgeous hair and voice. And she was a vampire and suffering this agony of being a vampire. And I thought, well, this is so incredibly interesting. This is so tragic. It's so rich. It's so exalted. I want to be a vampire. You know, I want to be like this countess. Uh, I want immortality and heartbreak and glamour. And I, again, I think it's built into the concept. You know, there's a movement today in America to domesticate the vampire, make him into a small town creature, goes to high school, <laughs> you know, Lots. lives in the backwoods of Louisiana <laughs> in true blood. And that's fun too, but I still prefer my cultivated, um, eloquent, old world monsters who like to quote poetry and every now and then drink blood in a crystal glass.